Hey, and welcome back to The Mind Report. I'm Jonathan Phillips from Yale University's Departments of Philosophy and Psychology. And today we're talking with Nina Sturminger from Duke University. Welcome, Nina. Hi. <laughs> it's great to have <laughs> you here. So Nina did uh, her PhD at Michigan, and she's now, uh, doing a, it's now a postdoctoral associate at uh, Duke University. Um, so we're going to be talking today about uh, personal identity, or you know, that sense of self that we all have. Or, you know, as I like to think about it, the psychology of, dude, you're not even the same person anymore. Um, and That's Nina's, a really good way of putting it. Thanks. I, I, and Nina has spent, you know, the last several years actually studying that, that question. So why is it that we, <laughs> and when do we say, dude, you're not the same person anymore? Um, but, you know, that I think it also ties into a lot of interesting uh, philosophical questions about, you know, what is personal identity and, and, and what is the self? So, so maybe you can just start by talking a little bit um, sort of about the earlier research and then we can, we'll talk about the more recent stuff later as well. Okay. Um, well, I, I guess I could uh, start by saying how I became interested in this. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, when I was watching some episodes of the X-Files. <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, as one does, I was just sort of binge watching X-Files yeah. on Netflix and um, I noticed that there were like certain episodes where a person's soul would leave their body and go into another body. Uh, yeah. And this is actually referred to in screenwriting biz as the soul switch, that sort of narrative structure. Yeah. Um, and, and I noticed that not all the psychological properties of the, the person's soul would necessarily like obtain in the new body. Right, right. Uh, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And, and, you know, we really didn't have me and Sean Nichols, who's been my co-author mm -hmm. on almost all of this, my and my collaborator. Um, he uh, we, we we didn't have any real specific hypotheses about what it would be. I mean, probably right. it's going to be, you know, psychological traits more than physical traits. Um, but beyond that, like what other traits would it be? We, we it was very sort of um, a theoretical to begin with. Um, so were you guys watching X-Files together? <laughs> no, and I feel like I need to like defend his honor because not only was he like not watching any X Files, but he like explicitly forbade me from making any reference to the X Files, like in in the manuscript. Like yeah. you know, he is actually like pretty hands off in like the editing process. But there were a couple times where I wanted to put like a footnote or two that was like, you know, spoiler alert for like season three, episode eleven. Uh, and he was like, yeah, yeah. you know, we're just going to delete When the soul this. transfers, they don't like peanut butter sandwiches anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, Sean being a philosopher, I, I can see him. Uh, <laughs> right. No, I mean, he's like, he's plenty nerdy, but just not in that particular dimension. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, so you started watching X-Files and you, you found the, the gripping question that you were going to devote several years of your life to. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's funny how it never starts off that way. I mean, we just thought this was, a, it was very whimsical. Um, but then when we started to look at the traits that were coming out on top, we noticed that they tended to be uh, psychological uh, and specifically moral mm -hmm. traits. And we thought, well, that's interesting, especially in light of all this philosophical work that places an emphasis on uh, memory, particularly episodic memory. Mm -hmm. um, so and what so do you mean by ep episodic memory? Uh, so uh, there are, uh, I mean, there's a few different types of memory, uh, but the two um, ones that we're sort of consciously aware of are declarative memory, which you might think of as like facts um, about the world, like Paris is the capital of France. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's episodic memories. Those are things that happen to you, like your visit, you might remember your visit uh, to the Eiffel Tower. Um, yeah. But those are, uh, as it turns out, at a cognitive level, instantiated in completely different ways. Um, and actually, uh, when it comes to the way we conceptualize uh, the identity of other people and ourselves, also hmm. uh, considered distinct. Um, yeah. So people do value their own, like memories of their own experiences as being more uh, uh, constitutive of their identities than uh, facts about the world. Um, so if they were right. to lose declarative memories, that's not considered as devastating to uh, personal uh, continuity. Uh, but um, if you forget like the, you know, the actual experiences you've had or something, then somehow that, that feels much more good. Right. Yeah, so. and it also seems like it turns a lot on uh, the exact type of memory. Hmm. Um, so not uh, so not just the memory system, so episodic memory, but um, also whether it's uh, very positive or negative or just neutral mm -hmm. sort of um, memory from the past. Uh, so so really like strong good and bad memories 
those are what's really and as particularly it seems like in social relationships so like bad or good things that have happened to you like you know with your family or loved mm -hmm. ones and those are things that if you lose them they're seen as changing your identity much more than just for example uh, losing me memories of like your commute to work. I mean, those are even those are those are episodic memories, but they're considered uh, basically. And uh, we have we do test that specifically. It's considered less important if you lose those memories, less important to your identity than becoming nearsighted. It's wow. really just like at the very bottom. Wow. So yeah. yeah. So forgetting that that you know certain episodic memories is, is fine. I mean, I might actually forget almost all of my episod episodic memories, right? but there's going to be certain ones that if I really forgot that, right? I forgot, you know maybe something like meeting my best friend or something. Yeah. Then that seems somehow more important, at least intuitively, right? Right, right. And uh, so uh, I think that, you know, one thing that we take away from this research program as a whole is it's not just that there's certain parts of the mind that are important to identity and certain ones aren't, uh, but that um, it's hierarchically arranged. Mm -hmm. uh, some are just, it's just to varying degrees. Memories are somewhat, somewhere in the middle. Uh, but moral traits, moral character traits, your beliefs, your values, your behaviors, uh, those are perched somewhat above even um, most memory, uh, memories, yes. episodic memories, yeah. Yeah, so, wait, so can you just walk us through an, maybe sort of an early experiment to, to, to try to just, so I can get a handle on it, how, exact, how mm. exactly you guys showed it? Right. So the most, like, the, probably like the most basic way you can think of it, uh, and this is um, study one in our paper that just came out in Cognition, uh, is where you have a, a man, uh, Jim, who's lost uh, part of his brain, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the doctors replace it with a microchip. Mm -hmm. um, and then depending on what condition you're in, you see that Jim has either no cognitive change, so just that physical change of losing a little bit of his brain tissue, mm -hmm. uh, or he has a, a, a low-level uh, cognitive injury, which is, in this case, um, visual object agnosia. He can no longer recognize mm -hmm. objects when he sees them. So that yeah. kickball in the background that's behind yeah. your head, he wouldn't like know how to identify that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for example, uh, or uh, he uh, develops apathy, uh, which is a clinical syndrome where all the things that you used to, you used to desire and that used to interest you and your preferences, those sort of uh, fall off and you're not interested in them anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is uh, episodic amnesia, so he doesn't remember any events that happened to him before the injury. And the final uh, condition is he loses his moral compass. He no longer knows the difference right. between right and wrong. Uh, and so we find that in, in the order that I just said them, uh, that's the incre isn't the increasing order of uh, how important it is to identity with memories. Losing your moral compass being considered the most devastating uh, to who uh, Jim used to be. Jim is really no longer the same person at all if he doesn't right. know the difference right. between right and wrong. Huh. So, and that's the question you guys asked them. So is something like, is Jim, st after the, you know, this... What, someone implanted something in his brain. Is Jim, Jim still the same person? Right. Huh. Yeah. And we ask it in a few different ways, depending yeah. on the study. Um, you can ask, is it, you know, is this person, is the transplant recipient still Jim? Uh, mm -hmm. We've asked, like, is, you know, is this, this their, does this represent their true self? Is this who they really are? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, all of those ways of asking, although they are subtly different and uh, philosophers would consider them also like conceptually very different, yeah. uh, we yeah. find that all of them kind of uh, result in the same pattern of responding. Right. Interesting. So, I mean, one thing that's interesting about that case, right, is it seems like it was sort of against Jim's will. Like, it, I mean, someone, it sounds like someone in the way you set it up was sort of making, deciding sort of what Jim would, would do. So, I mean, do you think that there's something specific about that and then and then morality, where like you know, if you're making someone do something evil, that mm. seems to be like a really special case. Uh, uh, whereas, so we thought so too. Um, Leanne Young and uh, Larissa Heifetz, who's uh, her postdoc, and I um, ran some studies where we specifically manipulated um, um, whether you intentionally uh, took a pharma psychopharmaceutical drug or not, or whether mm -hmm. someone made you do it. Yeah. Um, and and it, it changed different traits. And we found that whether you intended to take the drug or not didn't matter, uh, which, yeah, yeah, which is puzzling, right? Yeah. Um, so, but maybe people are, are more insensitive to uh, the, the decision to take the drug. Um, I wonder, uh, I don't know, I, I wonder, though, if it matters, like, 
I don't know. Like if it, we actually haven't really looked at like mood altering drugs very right. uh, very much, which is in a way surprising given that that's like one of the most common. I mean, these are all very like uh, fantastical kind of situations that we've been <laughs> constructing. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, some of them obviously uh, bear more to do with reality than others. Um, but uh, the and surprisingly, in like the in like the drug ones that we've used before, we haven't really looked at mood. So maybe mood is more important. Interesting. So basically, I mean, another way to think about that is that, well, it just shows that your effect, the effect you're finding is really robust, right? It really is something about how we understand who other people are or, you know, what, what, is, what makes up the identity of, of someone else, um, right? And then it seems like if, if that's true, and so it just, then maybe it really wouldn't matter if, you know, someone surreptitiously, you know, slipped a com computer chip in your brain that somehow could change these traits or, or if um, you decided yourself, well, these are really going to be the things that that I change. I mean, both of those changes still seem like sort of they're extreme changes. And as you said, I mean, maybe we, you know, we, we aren't at that stage where we do have, you know, drugs or computer chips that can, that can really do that sort of thing. Um, do you think that if you just like worked on it, like, so, you know, there I was just like, you know, try, say I was just trying to change my personality or, or maybe I was trying to try and change my moral traits. So I was just slowly trying to become a worse and worse person. Mm. Um, would that, would that matter? Or would you still see the exact same traits showing up? Well, I mean, one thing that I'll say, uh, and we don't, um, we have we have data uh, that speaks to this, where we look at uh, first order and third order desires. Mm -hmm. uh, so where first order desires are, um, you know, you see the cake and you want to eat it because it's delicious. Yeah. The third order desire is, well, the cake is bad for me and I'm on a diet and I probably shouldn't eat it. Mm -hmm. um, and we find that uh, the third order desires, uh, which you might also associate with more like with willpower and with those are the things that are associated more more with the self. Uh, yeah. uh, so, I mean, then this is really consistent with the language that we use when we speak about acrasia or weakness of will, which is that, um, you know, it, you did it in spite of yourself. Right, right, right. So when I, you know, when I eat the cake, but, you know, but I've still got that nagging feeling that, oh, come on, you know, you, know you shouldn't be doing this. Right, like, yeah. it wasn't really Jonathan that ate the cake. It was, <laughs> you know, his, like, low willpower. Then there was yeah. a moment of weakness. Yeah, I'd like to believe that it wasn't really me that was eating, <laughs> eating <Yeah. laughs> the cake. <laughs> Uh, cool. So, but then it also seems like you know, if that if um, if you are finding out something sort of more deeply just about the self, then it should apply to like lots of cases, not just sort of when someone changes over time or something like that, right? Or not just cases where there's sort of a weird neurosurgeon. It should really change a lot of like a huge number of of of, of the way or a huge part of the way that we understand other people and which you know which changes they would make, which things would persist in cases like soul switching, like the ones that you were talking about. Um, yeah, and then we also have like, let's see, we have a study where we ask um, if someone, you know, the changes they undergo when they age, you know, you, you knew them when they were a young yeah. man, when they were 25, and now you're seeing them when they're, you know, 65 or something, and they've changed on a variety of dimensions. And, and this is something that's like familiar to everyone is that, you know, people change and right. not just because they have some sort of clinical syndrome, uh, but also because you, you know, you grow up, you either right. you become wise or you become bitter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good things happen yeah. to you or bad things happen to you and uh, and uh, you change um, and so even in those cases it's the moral changes uh, whether they're um, bad the like changes for the worse or changes for the better those are seen as being like making the person more dramatically different interesting so if you take a, you know sort of normal cases that say like you know my, my grandparents experienced as, as they as they got older um, where you know they lost a lot of memories I mean their physical body definitely changed a lot um, and then in some ways, I think their personalities changed a lot too, right? And their cognitive mm -hmm. abilities changed. I mean, maybe they were less social. Maybe they were less good at remembering things. Maybe they you know, weren't as quick as they used to be. Um, but it's really, it's none of those things that's making me think, you know, well, my grandmom's not really the, the person that she used to be. It's the fact that she's like, now she's just kind of like pretty nasty and, and, <laughs> and mean to everybody when, when right. she sees them. Right. Yeah, and this is something that... Um, uh, family members of people who have different sorts of dementia uh, will often like complain about like that you know if someone just loses their memories then it's much easier to just continue to love them because you can still see that person they're still there uh, yeah. they just don't remember you or they don't like have you know their like maybe their language goes uh, but you still perceive your friend or your or your loved one underneath 
persisting, you know, underneath right. uh, the, the disorder. Uh, but when it's a change to um, their like socio moral capacities, mm -hmm. uh, if they become a liar, or even in some cases, I mean, I think this is, a, I guess, an empirical question, but if they become better people, um, and I, I've talked about this before, but yeah. um, with my grandmother, yeah. uh, when she had dementia, uh, one of the first um, symptoms that she had, because she was always just like a mean kind of cruel person, <laughs> uh, may she rest yeah. in I peace. I don't know where you get it from. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, I don't know. <laughs> it skips a generation. So. <laughs> my parents are very nice. Uh, but yeah, uh, she yeah she was not like uh, the warmest person. And um, and one of the first changes that uh, like as her brain was just like deteriorating, that happened was she just became so nice and so warm and so huh. full of compliments. Yeah. And this is really when we were like, something is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> grandma is not grandma anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. So I, you know, it's because it, a lot of the way that we've been talking about it was that you have these negative changes, right? And there, that's when you'd start to see, well, this person really isn't the the same person anymore. But right, so then maybe if you get it in, in positive cases too, then it's just something about you know morality specifically. But it seems also weird. So like you know um, another uh, guy that's on the mind report, Josh Noe, who's a, who's here at Yale. Um, he he also has done this research on uh, people's true selves, and so in general, what he finds is that like he, well, people think the true self is the morally good self, right? So you know one of the studies which I think sort of helpfully is, illustrates is that he takes you know, takes participants and then uh, he asks them, um, he, you know, he asks them a question which will, they can say whether or not they're conservative or they're, they're liberal, right? And then he tells them a story about, say, something that the conservatives and liberals would disagree on. So say it was that there was, you know, there was some man who, you know, he started out as a, as a conservative Christian um, and he, you know, really um, went around and, and tried to convince other people that, that you know, homosexuality was wrong. Right. And, and then he, he worked really hard at this. He really, you know, he, he firmly believed it. He would, and, and then, but then later he himself, um, you know, got into a homosexual relationship and, and then left the church and just embraced a homosexual lifestyle. Right. So now, if, and then, then I, and then if, if I'm remembering correctly, I think what Josh found was that, you know, depending on whether or not uh, you're conservative or liberal, people would answer differently to, uh, they would give different answers to the question of whether or not that person's true self, a uh, sort of, came out in the end. So whether or not, what you know, was it really that, well, there was something just sort of keeping down his true self at the beginning. We know when he was a conservative Christian, but then at the end, his true self finally emerged. And that, that, that's what liberals sort of understood the picture as. Whereas conservatives thought, no, 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 it was his true self at the beginning, right? And then, and then it's just that everything got in the way, he got confused at the end. And, right. right. So, but and then, and then Josh's explanation of that is that, you know, well, we think the, the, the true self is the, the morally good self, right? But what seems strange about that then is that, so your research is, is suggesting, well, it's no any sort of moral change. So you take someone that's, that's you know, take grandma who, who <laughs> wasn't always the nicest person, and then she becomes morally better. Like, it mm -hmm. seems like if, if I were thinking along the lines of Josh's research, I would think, well, all along I should have been thinking, no, deep down somewhere in grandma, like her true self is just in there and her true self just wants to be nice to me, but instead she keeps yelling at me and, and et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, I mean, I, yeah, and I had like, you know, at the time I had sort of, I wasn't clear on what kind of um, na naive model to apply to my grandmother's mind, right? Yeah. Is it that she was always, she always had these nice thoughts and then she just <laughs> had this sort of like all these weird barriers that right. now like the disease has kind of stripped away and we do see her true self. Right. Uh, or is it that she's fundamentally changed? So um, I, I'm completely, I, I love that work that Josh has and um I am really sympathetic to the view that there does seem to be an asymmetry uh, where we prefer to see uh, people as uh, fundamentally good rather than fundamentally bad. Although this might, you know, depend on your kind of view of human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you're more of a Hobbesian or more of a, a Lockean, I suppose, or a, no a, a, a Nobesian, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the adjectival form is yeah, uh, yeah. for that. Like but, a Nobian. Um, I think that one's fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I still, I think that I'd like to push against this idea that, that it's always, uh, the true self is always good. Mm -hmm. um, it might be, so like, so take the following uh, example. Um, a, a man, imagine a man who, um, he loves animals. Mm -hmm. um, he's a vegetarian. He loves to paint. He's sort of an artist. Uh, and he also like tried to exterminate the Jews. All right. 
Uh, so this person, uh, like we, I think that most of us have the intuition that Hitler was evil, yeah. uh, even though like he did have some good qualities, you know, it wasn't just that like, oh no, yeah. like all that, like, you know, Jew stuff and like killing everyone and trying to take over Europe. Like, like he wasn't really, a, he was just misunderstood sort of animal lover. Yeah. Like no one, I don't think sees it that way. I mean, no, like maybe no, some so. people do, but, uh, by and large. The neo-Nazis. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But yeah, most of us still see, and I think that's the same thing with psychopaths. Um, mm -hmm. these are people who we are willing to say they are a bad seed. They're evil to the core. Um, right. but, um, as to whether there is like a general bias to seeing people as more positive, I think that's quite possible. <clears throat> right. So maybe you, so nicely you, you've suggested that there are, there's no real conflict between <laughs> your research and, and and Josh is, it, it might be that Josh is picking up on some sort of, you know, there is some asymmetry that we are over, all, you know, all things considered, slightly more biased towards seeing like the, the true self is good, but that that's sort of neither here or there. I mean, for your research, because what your research is basically showing is that morality is really important for, for personal identity. Right. Um, and it can go either direction. Yeah. And one of the key things that it was meant to, uh, well, I guess there were two, um, sort of previous theories that uh, we were really trying to address. One is the view that uh, in philosophy that psychological continuity, which had usually been in, in, uh, conceptualized as episodic memory, so having a continuous inner narrative, mm -hmm. uh, that is really what is important for personal, uh, for uh, identity continuity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to knock down that pillar, which has really been, uh, I mean, that has been the canonical view for a long time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and I think that's like the least radical view that's been canonical for a long time. I mean, there's even, there are more extreme versions, as I'm sure uh, you're aware, in philosophy where like, you know, either like that it has to be physical continuity or bust, or like if there's any sort of psychological discontinuity, then like all of identity just crumbles, which is also uh, seems at least, you know, now we've demonstrated for folk notions. I mean, we can't really speak to sort of these larger metaphysical questions right. of what we, we, identity we really, really is. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> We, we, we can't really, uh, our studies can't n <laughs> and don't intend to address that. Um, but then, uh, you know, it's funny, though, because when I talk to philosophers about this, they think it's interesting because of what we've shown with memories. But when you show this to psychologists, many of them say, oh, yeah, that's obvious. Uh, and that's because, right. I, I mean, for maybe for a few reasons. But one of, one of them is that uh, the view of identity has largely in psychology revolved around uh, conceiving of identity as being about like how to like identifying like mm -hmm. how do we you distinguish yourself from the pack and so it's really the most distinctive features of ourselves that make us who we are um, yeah. and it seems like that's not true either because when we look at well like you know let's say that um, you really like jelly beans is really <laughs> liking jelly beans what made Ronald Reagan who he was well it is a very distinctive feature yeah. but it's not really what made him who he is yeah right yeah, yeah, that seems right um, Right, so then, but I mean, now you're just sort of raising the question, well, you know, why? Why does morality matter so much? What's, what's going on there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, with we, memories, I had, you know, <laughs> well, we <laughs> philosophers had, a, had, a, had an okay idea. With, with physical continuity, we also had a pretty good idea of why that, that sort of thing might matter for the metaphysical question. But, you know, in, in our folk understanding of, of people, why, why morality? Yeah, so this is something that um, we we have also been puzzling over, and I think there's a few ways you can answer it. One is at you know at the level of mechanism. Uh, mm -hmm. So how is it? How does it come to be that morals are more preferred? And you know, Sean and I have a sort of a story about that that we can talk about. But probably the question that you're really interested in is you know why at an ultimate level, like why would we value uh, these things more uh, than mm -hmm. other aspects, uh, parts of the mental traits? And our provisional answer is just that um, the whole, maybe the whole reason that we even make distinctions between individuals in the first place is because we want to figure out who are good affiliation partners, mm -hmm. who are good business partners, who are good romantic partners, uh, right. who are good like friends. Uh, and if you're really keying into those, uh, um, you're seeing people in those terms, then maybe you don't care about what their memories are. You don't care about whether they can identify objects. <laughs> you might not even like super care about if they're really bright. Right. Um, but uh, the thing that's going to matter when it really comes down to that the most right. uh, is whether they're honest, whether they're decent, uh, whether they can be trusted, and so forth. Right, right. So that that's what, that's what we think is going on. Interesting. So the thought is, well, you know, if I if I see somebody once and I find out they're really bad, right? 
And like, I shouldn't really be keeping track of that guy. Like, I should not let that, like, I shouldn't confuse that guy with somebody else. I need to keep track of that guy and make sure I stay away from him. And then maybe and, similarly with cooperative people. Well, right. So, yeah. and this is, uh, this is one reason, I guess, a priori reason to think that positive and negative traits are both pretty important. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. So it seems like on, on this explanation, though, you should really see um, first and third personal differences, right? So it seems like because the explanation you're giving is really how I keep track about other people, but I shouldn't be so worried about myself, right? I shouldn't, I mean, it's hard to lose track of your, I mean, maybe it's easy to lose track of yourself, but <laughs> if, at least in the, in the sense you're talking about, I don't need, I shouldn't see these, the, these effects maybe arising in first person cases where I change, my, my own moral system changes. Is that right? Well, um, so it depends on how much it's important to maintain like a positive self-image and then that then you can portray to others. Mm -hmm. I mean, and a lot of psychology kind of focuses on like that's what the self at, from a first person perspective is about, right? It's about mm -hmm. like creating this coherent story that other people can have that's like positive and sort of burnished. Mm -hmm. uh, and in which case you maybe should expect the same things that people when they're when dealing with their own personal continuity should key into the same things and i should say that just at an empirical level this is we find the same thing huh. so when we ask yeah. people like you know you know if, if you jonathan were to change um like what would make you jonathan like the most different person <laughs> yeah. um and i can tell you what your answer would be <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh what is my answer you know <laughs> It's whether you like jelly beans or not. Yeah, well, so I we had so. like we <laughs> we were just at a meeting where uh, one of the people in the audience, uh, Edward Mashery, uh, mm -hmm. he said like, well, you know, most people I'm not going to try to do the French accent. <laughs> uh, but he said, well, if mo most people, maybe they v um, value morality, but I really value intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what would be important for my sense of self and, you know, right. for my sense of pr continuity of, of other of, of other people. Uh, and I had like just gotten done showing that uh, <laughs> psychopaths are like the only ones who value like intelligence more than <laughs> more than the other moral traits. Uh, so. Huh. <laughs> wait, wait, okay, let's step back. So, so, yeah. so, okay, wait, so first, you said first you, you guys, you have, you have done the first, first, third personal studies. You've actually done the studies on that. We have. Yes. And then, and you basically find the no difference at all between, you know, which things I think matter for change, my own personal identity changing and which things I think matter for other people's personal identity changing. Right. So. We find, um, I mean, I don't know how interesting this is. We find like a main effect of uh, people saying that other people change to a greater degree when any trait changes, oh, yeah. uh, no matter what the trait is. Uh, but in terms of the overall pattern, uh, yeah. moral traits are still at the top of the heap for um, first-person judgments. Good. And then, and then moving, moving back to humble, uh, humble right. Edward, <laughs> the, the, uh, you've actually also done these studies on psychopaths. So you've been asked psychopaths in particular whether or not, which things they think would matter for people's, for other people's, whether or not other people change, is that right? Uh, yeah, so what we, um, okay, so we, we did it, in a, we've done it in a few ways, and mm -hmm. I should also just, because um, if, like, any of my colleagues are listening, they will not allow me to say that we've looked at psychopaths. No. We've looked at <laughs> uh, psychopathy, mm -hmm. uh, the personality trait, uh, which... Uh, there's like natural variation. Uh, most normal people don't score a zero on the psychopathy score right. uh, scale. They, right. they score, you know, like sort of like kind of low, but not at zero. Yeah. Um, and th these questions are just things like, you know, is it okay to ever take advantage of someone for your own gain? Um, like might makes right. Like these sort yeah. of things that they, they key into, uh, you know, basically not caring about moral principles uh, when, it, uh, when it's contrasted with like selfish gain. Uh, so it's and the ordinary the psychopaths. Yeah. You're not the extraordinary right. and, ones, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, like we don't have, like, have you ever killed five or more people? <laughs> but yeah. that'll be our next thing. We actually Good. do want to go into, like, person populations with this because I think it would be important to show this with, like, clinical populations as well. Mm -hmm. But it's fair to assume that, like, the people who are scoring at the very top uh, uh, of our scales, they do meet, um, they would probably meet the clinical, uh, criteria for psychopathy as well. We just, you know, we did, right. we just didn't use a very advanced instrument, but in any case, um, 
we find that the higher someone's psychopathy score, uh, the people who are at like the highest psychopathy score, it basically erases um, the preference for moral traits oh, over yeah. the uh, over like desires and preferences and over memories. Um, and similarly, the people who are like in the bottom quantile, uh, who are lower than average in psychopathy, and so these are basically like kind of moral saints. Mm -hmm. These people uh, really value morality even more than the average person. Interesting. So, so when the you know the, when the ordinary psychopath you know sees you say, are you asking them questions like which of these things would matter for whether or not the person is the same person, or are you giving them a story in which that thing changed and you're asking them? We're doing both. Doing We're doing it? both okay. because we did it both with. Uh, I think I've mentioned both of these uh, paradigms already. One in the case where um, there's a brain transplant, mm -hmm. and part, and so, and you have, uh, you know, you either remove the moral trait or you mo remove the desires or the memories or whatever. And then we also have done it with if you take a pill, yeah. um, and the pill changes any of a variety of traits, some of which are related to personality and some of which are like related to morality and so forth. Interesting. So the so the so the psychopath then see you say you know well th this guy took a pill now he's become like a, a particularly sort of bad person and he you know, now he's just a real asshole and psychopath is like yeah same guy it looks like the same guy same guy to me right which is <laughs> right so now we're getting back to like I guess how we began talking about this is which is you know how what's the actual mechanism here hmm. because if the mechanism were that we only care about who's the best affiliation partner mm -hmm. I mean everyone should care about being with someone who's honest and trustworthy and right. nice especially if uh, you're a psychopath right especially yeah. exactly <laughs> right you want to know who like the gullible suckers are so you, <laughs> you're probably going to be keeping track on of them yeah. um, but when it comes to to making judgments about um, personal continuity, um, uh, the psychopaths just, uh, they don't value it, huh. uh, which suggests um, an alternate account, at least of the mechanism, uh, and this is just sort of like tentatively uh, mm -hmm. what we think is going on here, is that people look within. They say, well, what would be important for me? What do I value? And then they, um, they project that onto their judgments of others. Interesting, and so that would could also make sense of the the sort of moral saint people that you that you had in your population as well. So they look inside and they think, well, you know, what's really important to me um, is, is that I'm a good person. Right. And so if someone else lost that, that's that special right. morality. Right, and then yeah. when Edouard Machery looks inside and he says, what's important <laughs> to me? It's being you know the smartest person ever, and so that's what's important for other people as well. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it suggests that you'd get a lot of variation. Um, not just on the moral things, but on lots of different different types of personality traits that, that might matter for personal identity, right? Um, oh. So, like you know, so take take Edward. Edward seems to <laughs> admittedly <laughs> yeah, really I really privilege. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we should pick on him. I, I suspect <laughs> that bias is present for like all academics, right? But yeah. So take your you take your honest. average academic, yeah. Yeah. Who, who, who and you know, and she really prizes her intelligence, and and then intelligence should really matter for her, and then you know, take someone that that. You know, it's just not particularly interested in being intelligent. It's not something that's ever really, you know, been very interesting to them. Um, you should see intelligence mattering less for them. You know, if you if you have this sort of simulation account, then it seems like you you get a lot of sort of individual variation, just depending on which things are most important for me. Yeah, um, right. It just um, when you look at it in the aggregate, what most people agree most of the time is that. Uh, moral traits are, are the most important, but any given individual is probably going to have some blips and exceptions um, to, to what they value the most. Interesting. Um, huh. Yeah, so maybe, yeah, right, and that would, that would also fit really nicely with your sort of first, the lack of uh, much of a finding between first and, and third person cases, right? So whether I'm thinking about personal identity for myself or for others, if the sort of mechanisms that you're proposing is, is right, then maybe we, we shouldn't expect to see. In fact, we should see like a high correlation between like the things that matter for you and the things that matter for other people. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is um, just so that I don't this we don't sound like this is totally original. It's actually really consistent with like a huge literature on like theory of mind, mm -hmm. things like the false consensus effect, which is where you know we tend to believe that everyone agrees with our own positions, uh, and this just apparently is is due to the fact that we think, well, what do I believe? Well, that must be what everyone else believes as well. Well, because I'm right. Yeah. All right, and that yeah, right, because you're right, and also because everyone's just like me. It's yeah. just the kind of narcissism yeah. effect. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the cases we've been talking about are sort of, I mean, you know, they're cases of sort of hypothetical cases that you give people. I mean, do you think that this is also just going to translate into 
sort of how we understand, like, when, how I understand my best friend, not when I read a vignette about someone taking a pill, but, like, you know, the, you know, the moment when I say, dude, you're not even the same person anymore. You know, you've really changed. You know, is this, is, do you think this is, it's really going to be the same sort of throughout? I mean, if so, it could really matter. Uh, yes, I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, the onus is on us and now other researchers to take this out into the field and show it um, in across different contexts. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So one context I think you could you could be interesting to look at in is, is like, you know, at least the, a lot of the philosophical theories have thought, well, you know, continuity of the person is going to really matter for sort of things like moral responsibility, right? So, you know, if if the person really just isn't the same person anymore at all, then like maybe I wouldn't, you know, want, really want to punish them for, for things that, that they've done. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's part of why maybe, or at least some of the explanation of why people were sort of focused on memories. So, right, so like, you know, I come to my defense and, I, and, and I've done something terrible. And, you know, and I'm just saying, I can't even remember it. I, you know, I completely blacked out. I have no recollection of it. You know, that just wasn't me. Right. Mm. Okay, so here's like an experiment yeah. that I think we should run. Okay. Are you ready for yeah, this? Yeah, let's do it. So, it's, <laughs> because actually, like a long, long time ago, Fiery Kusherman and I d discussed like an, uh, a way to do this, but I don't think we were doing it right. And now I think I have an idea of how we can do it right. Um, so you can imagine that if you had uh, someone committed a crime mm -hmm. uh, and then they uh, got, or they were hit on the head and they either suffered from amnesia or then they uh, their moral character changed such that they no longer had those intentions or violent desires. Right. Uh, I think, it, you know, of course, this is testable, but I think what we would find is that um, the person whose moral character changed is going to be deemed less culpable uh, for the crime yeah. of the person who merely yeah. can't remember uh, his crime. Interesting. So but, I mean, what's funny about that, right, is like now and I've got like a new, <laughs> next time I do something really bad, right, I mean, the way that I'm going to try to get out of it is just by becoming a much worse person overall, right? And then it's somehow that's going, because I'm no longer going to be seen as the same person. Oh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, because like, yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm not sure if it would work that way. Because I was <laughs> suggesting that you become a person who, like, no longer would have the bad intentions of, like, the per sort of person who would do the the, the crime. Right. Uh, I don't know if it works for just, like, <laughs> if you just become, like, a total asshole. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, well, forget it. He's a lost cause. He's a total asshole now. He was no longer the sort of okay person that he used to be. I don't know. Right. But so on your theory, like, it shouldn't matter if I change but to become morally better or change to become morally worse. What matters is that, like, I'm not going, because of the ch change of, of sort of my moral character, I'm not going to be seen as the same person anymore. So then I might not be punished as much. So it seems like, you know, yeah. I might as well just sort of start taking advantage of everyone <laughs> to, to <laughs> a really reprehensible moral character. And then yes. maybe by that I could I could I could escape all of my <laughs> past evils that I did when I was sort of an okay person. I advise that to you. I advise that to all of our listeners. Like, <laughs> that I've finally made a difference with my research. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So when yeah. you when you uh, are able to go into clinical um, psychopathic populations, you know, in in prisons, you should. <laughs> it's one of the things <laughs> you should. One of the tidbits you can you can tell them about the the real world impacts of your research. Right. So like all they were focusing on like finding Jesus and stuff and I'll say no, you just need to like get more in touch with your inner psychopath. <laughs> yeah, well maybe you could also get in touch with Jesus. Maybe it would work just as well. <laughs> but it wouldn't work any better according, <laughs> according to your <laughs> Well, uh, I mean I don't think that our theory makes strong predictions that it wouldn't matter, right? It seems yeah, evident yeah, that yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. But but yeah, yeah. It, it might it might actually be the case that there are certain sorts of unrelated moral change that could happen that would matter more than than memory changes. Hmm. Yeah. So so another interesting implication of well I don't know actually it's a, it's just an interesting question uh, it's, but it, you might think that there's one question of just sort of how um, how much is this the stuff the sort of intuitions we have about personal identity or the way that we sort of keep track of it the changes that matter just sort of built into us in some way that, you know, there's not much learning involved in it. Um, and how much is it that this sort of like, you know, over time we realize the importance of keeping track of things like, you know, people's moral character or, you know, desires or, or preferences. Um, you know, is there, are you going to see differences, not just sort of, uh, or we, for instance, we see differences in like the way children understand and personal identity and sort of like what happens after you die and things like that. 
Uh, right. Um, so I, <laughs> thank you. That was a very nice way to segue into some more data that I have, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Like halfway yeah. into that, I was like, oh, I see what he's doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we have, we have looked at this in children. Um, now, these are very complicated cases mm -hmm. to kind of bring to children uh, and attempts. I think there have been some attempts by other real developmental psychologists hmm. um, mm -hmm of which I am not one, uh, <laughs> to, to get at like, you know, young children, like, you know, three and four year olds or five year olds. Right. Um, and they, they're not able, I think, to even understand, uh, the problem, uh, quite yet. But when you go to a slightly older cohort, um, eight to 10 year olds, uh, which yeah. is, uh, where we've collected data, um, that's, um, Larissa Heifetz and Leanne Young and I, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, we find, we do find the same pattern. Uh, that you find with adults that um, that children are they value uh, they say that me uh, morality change matters the most both for themselves and for others um, oh. to to identity. Interesting. So, so as young has been sort of adequately tested, this is, you don't find much change sort of across development. As early, as early as you've been able to test it, kids really do seem to think in the same way as adults do that you know morality really matters um, in terms of personality. Right. I mean. I think, and that might just end up being because your whole uh, conception of um, a diachronic numerical identity that persists across time, that that uh, idea comes online later than ideas mm -hmm. about um, the self, ideas about what we value and morality. Um, so it might not be possible. I mean, it would be, ultimately we do want to be able to see if is any sort of cultural or developmental change like what you know what does uh, affect this right. and um, Sean Nichols, Jay Garfield, and I uh, are doing some work uh, in Tibet now uh, huh. on Hindus and Buddhists who oh, have yeah. differing conceptions right. of the self and the self's permanence to see if that makes a difference. Um, right. Personally, and I'm sort of just gonna like put like my ass on the line here because we don't have the data yet. Yeah. Uh, but I think we, we will find, and it certainly would be very interesting if we do find, that those beliefs don't matter that much. So right. even though Buddhists profess that, you know, the self is ever changing, mm. there is no such thing as like an identity that you can pinpoint across time for a person. I think that, you know, if we, when we ask them, we will still find um, that moral traits are, are valued over and above other sorts of psychological traits. Um, the, yeah. the, these folk notions sort of transcend um, cultural learning, but you no, know, it's an empirical question, and we'll we'll know the answer soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's good. You know, making your pred predictions, predictions. And now, now right. we'll know it's when you write that paper, and <laughs> and, and, when my, and like our hypothesis is like something different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the importance of culture and changing, you know, beliefs about personal identity. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, a lot of my, I mean, I think it's important to just make your hypothesis whatever you found. So <laughs> yeah. that's right. good science. <laughs> but so it seems like one way you could try to test it in kids is that I know there was this, you know, I think a really interesting research um, done here. Um, I think it was actually done here. I know Paul Bloom was on it at least, um, where they were looking at, you know, so, was, you know, I think these are actually cartoon characters, but they were asking pretty young children, you know, to, you know, Here's this. Here's this cartoon character. Say he's an alligator, and now he dies, or whatever. Right? I mean, like, in, mm -hmm. and now, but you now you want to know, like, do kids? Which things do kids think he'll still be able to feel? Right? So, will he still be able to feel hungry? Will mm -hmm. he still be able to love his mom? Mm -hmm. um, will he still be able to to do whatever? And it seems like maybe that would actually could provide you one way of sort of testing this at, with younger kids, right? So, you know, you say, yeah. here's a really mean boy, right? Like, and this boy has just gone around and just beat up everybody he could find, and now he dies. Oh, so we um, talk about death with the children. That's a great idea. Okay, I like this. Or you know, you you have, you have <laughs> some nice more euphemistic way, right? So, but then the question is, you know, what will little kids think about? You know, will he will he will he still be a mean guy, right? Yeah. Um, will he still be a tall guy or a big guy? Um, and will you again find the same the same sort of pattern that you've been finding with adults? Um, where yeah. The, and I, I, it's funny, uh, and by funny I mean sort of ironic that um, that there has been at least some difficulty with doing this with children because the inspiration with a lot of the stuff that Sean and I have been doing comes from the essentialism work uh, from uh, developmental psychology. Yeah. Um, this whole idea of like, well, what what is the essence? What is like the true nature uh, of a person? Right. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so so maybe just to, just for everybody that is not as familiar with that work, do you want do you want to sort of give like a little bit of a background on the on the essentialist stuff and then sort of where your stuff will fit in this? Okay, I, I'll give it a, a whirl. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, um, a really important idea in conceptual development uh, that has been uh, pushed by uh, de developmental psychologists is this idea that. Um, children have an idea that there is a persisting essence to entities that is independent of sort of different kind of uh, phys physical transformations. Mm -hmm. So there's some kind of fundamental way uh, that a caterpillar and the butterfly that it becomes are the same thing, mm -hmm. even though they look completely different. Right. Uh, and so children uh, appear to be attending to different properties uh, that don't just have to do with physical appearance. So for example, teleology, so mm -hmm. it, it's history, how it was created, how it was made, uh, what the intentions right. were, uh, and that this is really what contributes to the idea of uh, the persisting identity, not just of a person, uh, but of any sort of entity. Right. Um, yeah. So you take, like, I think when some of the research that was done, you sort of take, let's say you took a raccoon, right, and then, you know, and we know what a raccoon looks like, but then we start giving it, slowly we start changing it all the way. So now it's, you know, we paint it black, and we give it a big white stripe on it, we make it, mm -hmm. you know, tail really bushy and mm -hmm. we make it really smelly right and mm -hmm. then the question is you know is it still a raccoon or is it now really a skunk yeah um, and little right. kids really i think really pretty young actually seem to think that they get this idea that no that's still well, still a raccoon right yes um, right so maybe in the in the same way you think well given that, that little kids sort of get that sort of essentialist thinking pretty young that maybe you should see something like that even in understanding other people as well, right? And maybe if the essentialism that you're tapping mm -hmm. into is sort of a moral essentialism, yeah, um, th you should expect to see these effects in pretty young children. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's totally right. And uh, the, that Frank Kyle stuff that, that you're referencing mm -hmm. and also Susan Gelman mm -hmm. uh, has uh, done a huge amount of work on this. Um, I. I know that Frank Kyle's book, and most of that work actually, uh, which just appears in a book, as far as I, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so there's like a huge amount of data that appears in his book that like just uh, ha a lot of it hasn't been like tested since, you know, whenever <laughs> that book came out, like in the late 80s or early 90s. Um, but I remember sort of uh, reading through it um, back when we were when Sean and I were first working on this project. And there are a couple of studies in there where uh, when he does the animal transformations mm -hmm. where he gave where he pitted like the psychological traits of the animals against their physical traits. So like mm -hmm. if it, it, you know, if it looks like an elephant, but it acts like a wolf, <laughs> what is it really? Is it an yeah. elephant or a wolf? Yeah. Yeah. And this is when you really begin to confuse the children. They're just like, <laughs> I don't know. It's a hybrid. It's something weird. Um, yeah. and, uh, and so trying to kind of make finer gradations even than that hmm. uh, would probably be a challenge, but there has to be a way. Yeah. Um, so uh, science will find a way. <laughs> yeah. Well, even, I mean, it seems like you could take this question with adults, and maybe you've already done this. Um, it sounds like you've done a lot. Of just asking, not like, when does someone change, but like, what's going to persist after that person dies, right? So which traits will a person will persist in a person after the, after they die? Like, are they still going to be morally good or, or, or morally bad? And then, Mm -hmm. Right, so if you take a morally good person and they now they die, is it like is the morally goodness of the person one of the things that if you you know if you believe in life after death, that's going to be one of their main characteristics after after they die? So we've also done that, okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> well, where we pit moral characteristics against uh, more per personality low moralization personality traits, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we say like you know if you could only bring one of these if. A one of these into the afterlife, which one would it be? Hmm. And it's either a moral trait, like honesty or trustworthiness or wholesomeness uh, or, you know, niceness, uh, or it's a more personality-related trait like, um, and by the way, when I say personality, I just mean a, a trait that is low on moralization. I, I don't think there's any kind of at a psychological level, hmm. a difference between what we're calling these moral character traits and personality traits. It's just that one uh, is considered more related to morality. Uh, and so the personality related traits would be like creativity uh, or intelligence. Um, and in like for every single, every single uh, character trait, that we, moral character trait that we looked at, that was considered uh, more likely to be pulled huh. into the afterlife uh, than every single, including, I mean, it was actually quite surprising. I was, when we, when we set out to run that study, I was like, 
should we even put intelligence and like some of these really good ones on here that like probably people are also going to value. Uh, but no, um, intelligence scored lower than all of the moral character traits, even like wholesomeness, which is like insane to me. Yeah. But but that's maybe my own personal bias where I think that being smart is more important than being wholesome. <laughs> like, a, like a good academic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe this can actually offer, offer us an explanation of, of you know, what, why bad people need to go to hell. Right. I mean, like, so if you think that, that why, you know, when people die, right, so they're going to die and they're going to take their sort of bad moral character with them. But now, I mean, it seems like it's, they're just, they're not going to, it's not going to work out for them in heaven. I mean, if they're in heaven, they're going to have to start doing all this good stuff and then they won't even be the same person anymore. So, right, yeah. yeah. So yeah, the bad right. people are just going to have to end up in hell just continuing to, to be bad. And that... <laughs> there is no moral redemption in hell. I think that, <laughs> you know, that's the way it was always taught to me. In the yeah. way I like to think of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and with that. <laughs> Good fire yeah. and brimstone ending. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much for being for being on the show. It's really fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Look forward to hearing more. Okay. All right, bye. bye.